leads to our last but not least panel. Uh, I'm more than honored to welcome Christian and uh, Suhail on stage representing EBRD, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, as well as APICOP, the Arab Petroleum Investment Corporation. In terms of how the panel will progress, uh, we will firstly take the form of a moderated discussion on key issues in the market, followed by um, audience Q&A, uh, which I attempt to aggregate later on. But first, um, let's hear from our speakers themselves. So Christian and the Suhel, uh, may you firstly introduce yourself, where are you sitting in, and what the role that EBRD and Apicorp are planning to play in the hydrogen space? Who's going to be the first? I can begin if you want. Well, thank you very much, Molly, for inviting me to this very interesting event. Actually, we learned a lot from the previous speakers and some uh, uh, very um, well-known faces on our staff. So uh, at the EBRD, my uh, responsibility in, in the context of our conversation today is to try helping uh, taking the first steps for the bank in financing projects in the broad space of clean hydrogen. I'm using clean on purpose because while our primary focus is going to be clearly on renewable hydrogen, we also keep the door open if you wish to other sources of hydrogen as long as, as Paul mentioned before, its carbon footprint is extremely low, if not zero. So I think uh, um, at this moment, uh, um, the bank, myself and the bank are really looking forward to combine uh, policy dialogue with the governments in creating markets and also um, uh, creating investment opportunities with our clients. So I think we are very optimistic that the very first projects will come sooner than we would have thought just maybe a couple of years ago. Thank you, Christian. And um, it's your turn, so how? Thank you, Molly. It's a pleasure uh, being here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, Apicorp, or the Arab Petroleum Investments Corporation, is a multilateral development uh, bank which uh, develops and fosters the energy sectors in the Arab and in the MENA region. Uh, we provide uh, financing uh, services through equity financing, project financing, in addition to uh, trade, uh, trade financing, as well as energy and research advisory services. Uh, and Apicorp is double A rated financial institution by both Moody's and uh, Fitch. I believe that uh, the, the discussion today on hydrogen as a theme is very timely as the theme is gaining momentum globally and in the MENA region. Although hydrogen might be, if you want, the holy grail of the energy vectors, yet certain aspects need to be clarified, need to be put in context, especially within this critical energy transition that the world is going through. And I hope that we can touch upon these issues throughout our panel discussion today. Very well, and uh, let's get straight into our first question, which is a general, which is a general one for both of the speakers. Um, what is the perception or how is hydrogen perceived among the, the decarbonization options for your company? Is hydrogen seen as uh, having a particularly privileged role, or it's just seen as one of uh, many decarbonization options? First up, uh, Christian. All right. Well, I think, uh, first of all, you mentioned the, the key word that is decarbonization, right? So if you look back again, even just a couple of years ago, there was a, a lot of uh, talking uh, at the political and policy level and also the industrial level about doing the best we can to reduce the carbon footprints of different economic sectors. While now you fast forward to today, two years later, and everything is about reaching carbon neutrality. So there's been a massively higher pressure coming from the stakeholders, broadly speaking, in enhancing all possible weapons that we can use in this, in this transition. Now, I believe hydrogen will not be a fit for everything type of a weapon, again, if you want to keep using this wall, but it's something that uh, it's a, a relatively precious resource that we should use primarily for those sectors that don't really have other reliable or realistic options to decarbonize. So, for instance, you can 
with the complexity of the case, but you can easily decarbonize the power sector with wind and solar. It's a matter of managing the overall system integration. Whereas uh, you still have a huge question mark on how some uh, industrial sectors, from steel making to I don't know chemicals in some segments, uh, and also long distance transportation can can reach carbon neutrality. So I believe. Uh, um, there will be a concentrated focus uh, primarily on those sectors uh, and those regions where there are no real credible alternatives uh, rather than a generalized use in all economic sectors. Yes, and the fossil hell, um, APICOP is going to issue around uh, 1 billion US dollars on green finance in the next two years. Um, how do you perceive the hydrogen business? Yeah, actually, the $1 billion green bond framework, if you want, falls within the green bond framework that we announced uh, as a result of the ESG uh, policy framework that we are adopting at Apicor. Well, we defined three uh, distinct categories that fall within the green bond framework, mainly renewables, uh, pollution and uh, prevention and control, and uh, promoting energy efficiency, especially in new build and retrofitted uh, buildings. Hydrogen, from an investor perspective, from a private investor perspective, we see any emerging technology in terms of risk and reward, if you want. When we look at hydrogen, we see very high risk, especially when it comes to technology risk and lack of clarity when it comes to reward and what could be the returns on such investments. So for now, we see that hydrogen is a, a vital tool to reach the net zero goals by 2050. It is the missing link maybe for, uh, for national governments to be on the track to decarbonization. But I think timing here is of the essence. Maybe hydrogen could be a mature market uh, where private investors can pitch in with financing, but maybe by the end of the dec decade and not now. And we can, we can touch upon why. First of all, we see high technology, technology risk, especially for green hydrogen when it comes to electrolyzers, blue hydrogen when it comes to CCUS projects, both of them, there are issues with modularity and with scalability as a technology, as a standalone technology. We see certain policy risks and the regulatory framework risks. We see, as I said, hydrogen now is not a tradable commodity yet, if you want. So it is being utilized or used at first point of destination, and it is not traded as LNG, for example. So until we reach where hydrogen becomes a fully tradable commodity market, we see the rules of supply and demand in play. We see clear pricing signals, whether spot market or uh, long-term indexed prices, for example. We can have some clarity on what reward private investors can expect from such investments, especially that it is a highly intensive capital investments that we are talking about. In addition to that, we have the issue of infrastructure and the need to deploy huge infrastructures, which needs maybe tens of billions of dollars. And all of that cannot happen without, for now, direct governmental support. And we can discuss in, in, what, in what type, what kind of policy tools can be implemented to promote that and activate the hydrogen markets if you want. Very well. And uh, when we talk about business models and the uh, structures, we talk about long-term prosperity and uh, risk mitigations. When I raised the question, uh, the, the, the top three criteria for financing a hydrogen project, uh, Christian, you put offtake contract as the top priority. So, yes, with so. Regard, yes, with regard to offtake contract, we need to have buyers first. Who do you think the buyers can be and which application or which sectors could be the early consumer of H2, in your opinion? Yes, and that's, uh, um, I, I believe naturally, and I think uh, uh, my, my colleague just uh, highlighted the, the answer already, right? Because uh, uh, what we are seeing these days uh, is that uh, uh, the projects that might become a reality pretty soon are nearly co-located, demand and supply are on the same place. And not only because of the distance and the, you know, the, the transportation from A to B, but it's exactly about the off-taker. So we, as a bank, 
uh, we as banks in plural, when we started financing renewable solar and wind like uh, 10, 15 years ago, the primary concern was the security of uh, cash flows, right? So it was about having bankable offtake agreements. And here it's exactly the same. We are exactly at the same situation where we were with solar and wind when we started uh, creating that market. And look at where they are today, right? It's a fantastic success of cooperation globally. Now on hydrogen is the same. So the issue is really about finding the demand. We are so much focused on the supply today, rightly so, but probably we are underestimating that there is someone at the end of the value chain that needs to, to pay for the kilograms of hydrogen they will receive. And so there is sometimes a bit of misleading perspective that uh, you blend it uh, in a gas pipeline and someone will pay, but that's not the real case. So that's, uh, that's the issue. So we need to start looking at the off takers in first place. So your question is uh, where you think uh, uh, you will find off takers more easily Right, so I think the obvious answer is uh, uh, fertilizer companies, uh, refining companies that are already existing users of hydrogen and very likely in many geographies are already under higher pressure on greening their supply chain. They need to decrease the carbon footprint of their products. And so there is already a market in place sometimes uh, to drive the transition and an investment decision from gray to blue or, or green. And so that's where I think uh, you will find easily of takers. Then again, very often there are industrial clusters in some manufacturing valleys, for instance, where you might have coexistence of different uh, industrial users that might need hydrogen for different purposes, but they just don't have the supply. So there you might have a critical mass of off takers one close to the others that justify a larger scale investment. And when you go larger scale, it's where you find the economy of scale more easily. And so then it probably it also becomes more competitive to take this type of investment decision. Yes, and a follow up question to that, because I think offtake uh, is going to be the most frequently touched world in this uh, session. Um, it, when we talk about offtake contract, it, it has to be an agreement reached by both the producers and users. And um, um, so far, um, limited uh, financing deals have been closed. How can we possibly identify the suitable offtake for hydrogen? The question goes to Christian and then to Suhail. Um, maybe rephrase the question a little bit uh, to give me a hint on the... Uh, sorry? If you can rephrase a little bit the question. Okay, um, so it's very simple. How can we possibly identify the suitable offtake contract for hydrogen? All right. Well, um, um, I, again, I, my advice is not to reinvent the wheel and look back at similar offtake contracts and offtake agreements that have worked a lot in other similar contexts. Again, for a financial institution, it's important to have clarity on the legal and commercial relations between the parties and the interfaces between the parties. So again, uh, look, uh, looking back at uh, uh, renewable electricity, for instance, but also the oil and gas sector, where there have been a lot of an industry in general, a lot of successful cases where some services have been outsourced to third parties, right? That's a perfect case where often you have very complex dynamics that are regulated by clear commercial contracts. So again, I suppose for me, it's about trying to pick the solutions that have worked in other markets and replicate them here. Because it's not, it's, this is not, a, it's a new product, but it's a, not a new market, if you want. So you can really mimic business models that have worked effectively in other markets. Right. Um, we've been talking about hydrogen since the, I think it's the uh, 1970s. 
Um, however, it's only uh, uh, recently, around uh, a year or two, that the hydrogen business is re really taking off. And to Suhail, uh, do you have any add-ons to the question? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Christian. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. We can learn from our previous mistakes and try to avoid them when implementing them on hydrogen. But I think going deeper than that, uh, when it comes to offtake agreements and contractual structures for hydrogen, maybe what's missing on a higher level is the laws and regulations which should cascade from the roadmaps and strategies which the national governments are doing. These should be cascaded down to really detailed laws and regulations that give some sort of fiscal stabilities, for example, in the contract, uh, some sort of uh, risk mitigation, commercial mis uh, risk mitigation, especially when it comes to standardization, certification issues, which are still missing right now. So the guarantee of origin, for example, uh, there is no international agreement if you want, if this is really a, a green molecule of hydrogen or a blue molecule of hydrogen, there are still disagreements. All of that should be uh, taken into consideration somehow in the contracts, in the contractual agreement between the supplier and, and the consumer. So uh, that's one thing. Second, for the offtake agreements, I think for now, the obvious offtakers are the hard to abate industries and especially the petrochemical and the refining industries, which are already using a gray hydrogen in their, in their activities as a feedstock. So the obvious solution is to start with hydrogen clusters or valleys near these petrochemical and refining industries, if we're talking about the GCC in the MENA. And this, this could be one step along the way to, to have some clarity when it comes to uh, how supply and demand is evolving, how are the contracts taking place, what are the price dynamics for the hydrogen market. So, uh, yeah, I believe that the regulatory and the policy risk plays a big role uh, here. In summary, Suhail, what are the key elements will be needed in place um, before an H2 project is fully financed by Apicorp? Uh, yeah, well, for financing a hydrogen project, it's like a, a puzzle with so many moving parts, so many uh, pieces that need to come together. If you want to summarize them, we can see five key areas that we need to address. First of all, as I said, the technology risk needs to be mitigated. When it comes to green hydrogen, we see a high technology risk with electrolyzers, as uh, Mr. Wael said previously. Uh, we have multi-megawatt sized electrolyzers, but with the scale of hydrogen anticipated, we need multi-gigawatt scale electrolyzers, and we do not have the technology yet. So that's one thing. For blue hydrogen, also CCUS, carbon capture and utilization or storage, we have globally now 16 maybe operational small and mid-sized CCUS projects. However, with the scale of blue hydrogen anticipated, you need larger uh, CCUS technologies, which are highly modular, and all of these currently are impacting the costs where we are not seeing any parity with gray hydrogen yet. So for an investor, you, you see only two choices. Either I enter the market now at very high cost, but I gain market, market share early on, or I can wait five, 10 years from now, I enter the market for a lower market share, but at a lower cost. So same thing what happened with the solar CSP, if you want, 10 years ago and, and now. So uh, that's one area, technology. Second area, we see the regulatory and the policy risk, which I touched upon. So you need to cascade these roadmaps and strategies to detailed laws and regulations and take into consideration the certification, the standardization programs. Third major point is to have an established commodity market, tradable commodity market for hydrogen, so that you have clear uh, market dynamics and comes on supply and demand and to see the clear pricing signals, what's taking place to measure your reward, basically. The fourth major area is the issue of infrastructure. So how, no, no matter how much production you have and supply you have, if you cannot deliver that along the value chain from transmission to distribution to storage, it's useless, basically, uh, only for the, uh, the, the, the nearby of takers, if you want. So you need huge infrastructure that needs to be put in place to, 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 to make a full optimi optimized use of that produced hydrogen. 
And finally, the most important thing is the governmental support. So governments can either activate the markets or kill the markets early on. Governments, they have a, a wide array of uh, policy tools in their toolkit that they can implement. For example, they can go into equity ownership in, in pilot projects that will give some assurances to the private investor. They can provide certain tax credits, uh, technology-specific subsidies, for example, if we're talking about electrolyzer technology, CCUS technology, uh, to mitigate the technology risk. They can facilitate access to markets since the region already has access to the oil and gas market. So it can facilitate that. It can kick off pilot and demonstration projects. And the, 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 the most important tool that we are seeing being implemented is the carbon pricing to incentivize switching from dirtier, if you want, energy vectors to cleaner energy vectors. So that could put the price of green and blue hydrogen on par with the gray hydrogen, the carbon pricing. So I see these five main themes, technology, regulation, infrastructure, commodity market, and governmental support. And um, it was a great uh, and comprehensive explanation. And to Christian, um, based on your past experiences, what are the two or three key issues or hurdles to implementing large scale finance, despite we have all the knowledge about key elements, what are the challenges? And uh, does uh, EBRD have any strategy to manage around these risks? Well, I think uh, specifically on large scale hydrogen, the issue is, well, I think Shavil already highlighted brilliantly the main pillars that any developer needs to take into account before approaching financial institution with a project. I think a peculiar uh, characteristic is that very often, especially if with large scale green hydrogen, you might have a, a large renewable electricity plants located in some locations. Then you have the grid to deliver the electron to the electrolyzer that is located somewhere else where you produce the commodity if you wish, and then it's transported to the offtake. And so I think the very first issue is that very seldom we will be able to finance the entire envelope as a single project. So you need, first of all, to try to break down the huge value chain into smaller components that can be more easily financed, not necessarily as standalone projects, but it will be impossible probably for any lender to provide financial support to a very complex and highly integrated project. So first of all, you need to break it down into smaller units and then define the interfaces, as we said earlier on, with the suitable contracts. And, um, and so I guess uh, that is one important issue. Number two is, again, the sheer say, size of this type of projects uh, create a number of issues on uh, on the financial risk, but also on the technology risk. So for us these days, it's still very difficult to find on something that doesn't have many successful examples somewhere else in the world. So a bank like us takes a lot of market and geographical political risk. So they are, we are the best counterpart, if you wish, to bring this new business model into a new market. But we are not designed to finance the very first project anywhere in the world. So there is still a, a risk of uh, um, you know, having very good opportunities in MENA region, for instance, because you have a plentiful of natural resources that will make it an ideal location. But there isn't yet the comfort of having seen something like that somewhere else that has been successfully completed. So again, it's a, the other challenge, if you want, is to create the first successful examples uh, with commercial agreements uh, in operation in the world so that the MENA region can replicate uh, the same projects. Again, it's about building confidence on the structures, on the technologies, so that lenders at the end of the day can better understand the projects and their risks and design the suitable mitigating tools around those risks. 
And in your opinion, uh, what are the actions that public and private sector in MANA need to take in order to speed up the growth of a green hydrogen economy? What kind of actions? Well, you, I can tell you what we are doing. So because we strongly believe hydrogen is an important opportunity and we need to help uh, uh, the countries where we operate, including in, in North Africa and the Middle East, uh, take uh, this opportunity on board. It's a combination, I think, of uh, different components. First and foremost, we are trying to engage with the governments to create the enabling environment. So very often, as, uh, as already mentioned, you don't have a, a, a regulatory framework that clearly enables this type of new operators to act in the local markets. And so first of all, we need to create a regulatory infra, uh, framework that uh, uh, allows for these projects to, to take up. Number two is also nonetheless, despite the huge interest that hydrogen is uh, attracting, there is still a lot of need for capacity building and helping clients structuring good projects. So again, what we are trying to do is to provide the support uh, uh, with through technical cooperation programs to try to ensure the private sector design good projects, effective projects uh, in different segments of the value chain. And then number three probably is to create the financial incentives that allow the decision maker to say, fine, we go ahead with this investment. We know that we can trust our partners, including the EBRD and the other financial institutions and the government. And so we think it's the right time to move ahead with the investment decision. So it's a combination of creating the markets and creating the competence locally for this type of projects to happen. Yes, and now we are, as we are zooming in the MENA region, it's quite an export oriented market and require quite a good amount of capital investment and production, transportation and the export facilities. Which timeline do you think um, um, it is foreseeing for hydrogen commercialization in MENA? And uh, how do you see the hydrogen and ammonia export market in MENA? The question goes to Suhel. Yeah, Molly, thank you for the question. Well, for every new technology being deployed and integrated in the, in the energy sector, there are usually three stages that it passes through, which we are seeing now. First of all, you have the first phase, which is scaling up and laying the market foundations. That's what's happening with hydrogen right now. And we, do not, we expect that this will continue to happen at least till 2025 plus. The second uh, phase that it should pass through is the widespread adoption and the market maturity. We start seeing a market maturity when it comes to hydrogen, and we expect to see that by the end of 2020, maybe early 2030. The third phase, which will be the full implementation of hydrogen as an energy vector in several applications, and we see that happening beyond 2030. So for the MENA region, we see that blue hydrogen, we are seeing the market foundations and scaling up for blue hydrogen for the, for the region. And uh, from now till 2025, maybe, and from 2025 till 2030, it will play a transitional role until we reach by 2030, the cost of green hydrogen will be competitive enough with blue and gray hydrogen, which can be fully implemented. The reason why I'm stressing on blue hydrogen is that, you know, the, the, the region is endowed with vast oil and gas resources with low carbon, low cost, and uh, you have established business models for the NOCs and the IOCs and blue hydrogen slightly disrupts, if you want, the existing business models for the NOCs and the IOCs. And you, disincentiv you incentivize them to adopt blue hydrogen as a clean energy vector, rather than antagonize them uh, by telling them you have to disrupt your whole business model and create a new one. So uh, this creates something we call a green paradox, where actually the NOCs and the IOCs will start monetizing their oil and gas assets on a faster pace and in fear of having them stranded later on. So this gives a negative feedback loop, if you want, for the whole energy transition journey that we are adopting. So uh, we see blue hydrogen being a transitional energy vector from now till 2030. Beyond 2030, 
we see green hydrogen being implemented as an energy vector. The export, the natural export markets for the GCC region is the Southeast Asian countries, mainly Japan and Korea, which the GCC will be in a very high and fierce competition, if you want, with Australia and Chile to, to supply the Southeast Asian countries. As for the uh, Europe, which is the other demand sink, North African countries have a high competitive advantage to supply through existing natural gas pipelines. However, the blending of hydrogen with the natural gas pipelines can reach 10 to 15% maximum, or else you have to create new uh, capital intensive hydrogen pipelines, which are thicker, which have different design uh, metrics. And, uh, but GCC can export to the Southeast Asian countries through ammonia ships, whether green or blue ammonia. North Africa can supply through pipelines. So this is how we see the MENA region emerging as a potential export market for both blue and green hydrogen uh, from now till the end of the decade, at least. Um, can I rephrase it in this way? So you think um, the green hydrogen will be the end game, um, but um, uh, for the near term, uh, let's say uh, until 2030, uh, blue hydrogen will be prioritized by the government. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Okay, great. And uh, um, now um, we come to our final question, which is a, 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 bit, a bit of a tricky question. Um, uh, I, uh, I want to have one more ask to both of the panelists. Uh, if you have, uh, to Suhel first, um, if you have the chance to ask one question for Christian, what would that be? And vice versa to Christian, what would be your question to Suhel before we wrap up everything? Shall I start with my question? It would be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but the first question that pops into my mind is which MENA country you see most competitive? If you want to finance a blue or green hydrogen project, which MENA country do you see as most competitive that you might take that step and, and finance it? It's a tricky question. I don't want to make any preference. First of all, as EBRD, we don't cover all these uh, all the countries in Middle East and North Africa. So we primarily cover North African countries, so the countries that look at the Mediterranean Sea. Um, there is an obvious early mover that we've already heard about earlier today, that is Morocco, right? That has a, a lot of reasons why in the region where we work again. So I'm not going to talk about uh, the Gulf countries. Uh, and, and, and so that is a, a country that has months literally of advantage uh, in comparison with its neighbors, because they started talking and acting on hydrogen before others. But I guess also for us, we hear a lot of uh, positive vibe coming from Egypt. There is a lot of interest, a lot of interesting opportunities being prepared there. So it's going to be a close race to see which one of these two will have the very first successful project. And then. Of course, you know better the Gulf countries than me. There are projects that are very well known today, and they are uh, very close to becoming a reality. And Maybe uh, the question my counter question is uh, because you you now mentioned this uh, interesting dynamic with uh, the national oil and gas companies. Uh, do you think? Uh, um, there will be this uh, sort of legacy effect in the policy decisions taken by these governments so that uh, to protect, uh, let's say, the current uh, uh, markets, they might uh, have a sort of preference for one of the hydrogen colors, if you want, rather than just making a level play field for all types of, of hydrogen production. I think uh, the, the national governments here, the GCC, are all adopting the energy diversification uh, pathway, if you want, with UAE's latest adoption of net zero pathway to 2050. So all the countries are trying to diversify their energy mix. And uh, I think both colors of hydrogen, green and blue, will be adopted within the energy mix. But the timeline might shift with respect to blue than 
with that of, of green. Why is that? Because the region is, as previously demonstrated, highly competitive in renewable resources and in oil and gas resources. So why don't take advantage of both and claim higher market share in green and blue uh, hydrogen? So I believe the approach for national governments for now, I mean, in order not to antagonize NOCs and IOCs, adopt a blue hydrogen uh, approach, which will disrupt slightly, I would say, their uh, existing business models, but you can counter that by providing certain types of incentives, uh, tax credits, uh, technology specific subsidies for CCUS, for example, to promote that, that change. Until hydrogen picks up, becomes an established commodity market, renewables costs also, and you have maturity when it comes to electrolyzer technology, then naturally it will enter the generation, the energy mix in, in, in the region. So I would say, uh, yeah, the, 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 the role of policymakers, they have to see the big picture. They have uh, to, to, to try to, to also, you want uh, to balance supply and demand dynamics. So you don't want to, as you said, to put a laser-like focus on producing and on supply without incentivizing or creating enough demand, or else you will, you will flood the market with low-priced hydrogen. And this will be a disincentive for newcomers to the hydrogen market, and the, the market will dampen itself. So uh, yeah, I believe both spectrums, uh, color spectrums will be adopted, but with the shift in timing, if you want. Christian, are you satisfied with the answer? I am very much so, thank you. <laughs> And, and yeah, it, it's a really great and a very interactive session, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, now it comes to the actually the end of uh, today's talk. Um, although I'd be very much love to um, have you talk about this forever, the time won't allow. Uh, if I may, I would like to take this opportunity thanking all of our great presenters today. And um, thank you so much to our audience for staying with us until now.